If you've been following us on Twitter, you might know that I visited Canada recently, specifically side effects for the launch of their new Houdini 19.5 version. And while being there, I took the chance of visiting some of the sites of Toronto and Montreal, amongst which was this, the AGO, the Art Gallery of Ontario. Amongst the artworks exhibited there were works by Yayoi Kusama, Henry Moore, and this piece I really liked. However, specifically for this sculpture, I forgot to take a picture of the plaque to remember who the artist was. So if you know who created this, in my opinion, really nice piece, please let me know in the comments. And for today, I wanted to explore a few new features of Houdini 19.5 with keeping this inspiration, the color palette and the materiality of this work here and the shapes and those panel lines of Henry Moore's work in the back of our head. Specifically, I want to use a new small hidden feature, kind of a low level node in Houdini 19.5, which is called the tangent field node. And I want to set this up to render in Karma using Material X. Because Karma at this point is becoming more and more production ready, with Karma XBU becoming increasingly interesting. So let's start by building our underlying geometry by, in our OBJ context here, dropping down a geo node as a container for our geometry and then diving in there. Let's just drag this over so we have a bit more real estate here. And then let's start building these abstract flowing shapes. And of course you could, and of course you could any technique you like, you could sculpt them, you could import them, you could model in Houdini, although I'd say that is brave. In my case, I go the generative slash lazy route and use a bunch of elongated spheres together with VDBs to create an organic shape. For this, I need two spheres. Let's start out with one and use the sphere create here to create a sphere, which we're going to set to polygon. So we have these triangular meshes here, increase the frequency to increase the subdivision of that sphere here. And then let's squish it among one direction or rather elongate it along one like so. Next, let's create point normals on this as this is the base mesh for what we're going to do. So using the normal node, which I'll attach here, set to points. And then we can check if the normals have been written using this switch here. And we can see we got normals on our points here. Okay, let's uncheck this and use the scatter node to scatter a few points on this surface. So a scatter goes beyond the normal node here. And in the scatter node, I set the total count here to only 20 points. All right, this will be the points where I instance smaller spheres onto. In this case, another sphere. Again, sphere create here. Set this to be a polygon. Let's set the view flag here so we can see what we're doing. Increase the frequency to 12 again to give this a bit of finer subdivision. And then let's elongate it along the Z axis, only a tiny bit for now. Let's wire both the sphere and these points here into a copy to point. Sphere goes into the first, the template points in the second slot, and let's highlight this one here. And we can already see we are creating some sort of organic geometry. However, all those individual spheres here have the same size. So let's change that by randomizing an attribute which the copy to points automatically evaluates to scale those different spheres individually, which is called P scale, which you can do using an attrib randomize. So that goes between the scatter and the copy to points. By default, this is set up to randomize the color using CD. Let's just call this one P scale like this. And immediately we can see we are now randomizing the individual scale of those instances that we copy onto those points. Let's dial this in a bit. So we don't need three dimensions for our scale. We only need one float and that should be between, let's say 0 0.5 and one here, like so. Under the options here, you can dial in the global seed in my previous setup. It was set to 836, like so. All right, next to smoothen out those individual transitions between those spheres, let's use the old VDB trick. First, creating a VDB from polygons using the node with the same name. VDB from polygons goes below the copy to points. By default, this thing is set up with a very coarse resolution. So let's increase the resolution by decreasing the voxel size to 0 0.02. That worked nicely in my case. Now let's smooth out those transitions here using a VDB smooth SDF like this goes below our VDB from polygons. And in this case, I set this up to have a filter radius of two voxels and the operation I set to Gaussian, which smooths out those transitions even more. Now this whole geometry is stored as an SDF. That means as a volume. So let's convert it back into polygons using a convert VDB node. And we'll set it to convert to polygons like this. No adaptivity in this case, just the default values as such. Now the mesh of this has the typical artifacts of a marching cubes algorithm. And to get rid of them, I want to use another remesh node, which I'll attach here beyond the convert VDB node. So remesh goes in here and let's set this up to have four iterations. And down here, let's decrease the target size to have a bit more individual triangles here to say 0.025. Again, values that I 
tested out beforehand. Now if we zoom in we have those kind of isotropic triangle mesh, that means a mesh with almost identical triangle sizes. Perfect. Let's save this and copy this remesh and paste it over here. Takes a while but here it appears. And let's remesh this one more time, this time with a larger size, 0.1 units in this case. So we have a bigger triangular mesh. And we're going to use these individual mesh points as origins of the particles that will form those panel lines on this geometry here. But more on that later. For now I want to work on our finely divided geometry, which will be the underlying geometry of our sculpture and from which we'll base our tangent fields off of. And that means a vector on each of those points that drives the direction of our particles that form those panel lines. But first, for later, I want to generate normals on here, again using the normal node set to generate point normals. And then it's finally time to drop the star of the setup, a new low level node in Houdini 19.5 called Tangent Field. Let's drop that down and let's switch on the tool handle here and we can immediately see this visualization of the tangent field we are generating. In this case, by default, it is set up to generate four individual fields. So if you look at these visualizers here, you can see it's the cross and any one of those arms pointing outwards from the center is a single vector field. If we quickly check the info, we can see that those fields are called field 0 through field 3. Again, each one storing a vector on each individual point. This node has a few tricks up its sleeve. Let's just scroll down here and we can see this thing outputs these dots in blue and in red. And these are singularities. What are singularities? Well, let's think of the vector field as the direction of hairs on an object. And let's think of a really simple and really weird object to have hairs, a sphere, let's say a billiard ball. And if this billiard ball had hairs attached to it, and those would be exposed to a force or would try to be combed in a way, there is no way that we could comb those hairs without having one kind of bald spot in its hairstyle from which all those individual hairs point away. You know, like those nasty spots, usually on the back of your head, where you always look kind of boldish just because all the hairs are standing away. And this is a singularity. So a sphere usually has at least one singularity in this kind of vector field, and our object here has even more. And here we can output a group that puts all those primitives on which a singularity exists into one group. And we can do the same thing for discontinuities in the vector field. That means harsh breaks in the vector field. Later we could use these groups to, for example, stop our particles at a singularity. But for now, for sake of simplicity, I will omit this. Here I want to just point out the guides, that's the curvature and boundary, and those drive how strongly this field is influenced by this object's curvature or its boundary layer. And in my case, I found the field very interesting that emerged when I scaled up the curvature here like so. So now this one tries to follow the geometry's curvature a bit more. Now there's two more things I want to do. First we can see if we look at this field, there are some discontinuities in here. You could see if you squint your eyes, that for example here you have kind of a fracture lines in our field here. And to smoothen those out, albeit making this tangent field a bit more imprecise, but again we're just using it as the basis for an abstract artistic expression, so I think we can get away with this. For this I want to blur out these fields by using an attrib blur. We shall attach to the tangent field here. Let's just, for the sake of seeing what's going on here, let's just visualize the field zero like this. And in our visualizers tab down here, let's right click in here and edit our field zero visualizer and switch its type from color to a marker, which should be a vector. And let's also normalize and scale down those arrows so we can see which direction those vectors are pointing. All right, let's zoom in a bit. And you can see, for example, here, there's a large discontinuity in my field. Let's just use our attrib blur, which we will set up to not use the pinned border points. And let's not blur our position, but let's blur our field zero, field one, field two, and field three. Not sure if we need all of those for our artwork, but let's just blur them anyways. I think for my setup, I blurred them pretty drastically, 16 iterations. And so now you can see this field is a bit smoother. All right, finally, before we started vecting particles over the surface here, let's create another field, which which is just orthogonal to this field that we are displaying here. So yes, I could use field one, two or three for this. In this case, I want to do that thing manually by just taking the dot product of our normal on our points, which we can display here, and this yellow vectors, which will turn those yellow vectors just by 90 degrees on the surface. We can do this either using a point vop or using one single line of vex. You know my preferred method. Just for now, I want to do it with a point vop. By the way, my preferred method is the single line of vex, but let's do that now. So in the point pop, I want to create the, or calculate the cross product of a normalized version of our field zero and our normal on the point. So the normal on the point is this here. 
and let's import into our point vop using a bind node. Let's import a vector and the vector's name is field zero like this. So now let's wire this field zero into the our normalized node. This just makes sure that all those vectors here have a length of exactly one unit. The direction isn't changed. Now we calculate the cross product of both this vector and the normal and then let's export it to a, another vector which we might be calling my field for example. So let's use a bind export and in here let's export another vector which I'll call my field like this and then wire the output of this cross product into the bind export here. All right, that's it. Those four nodes is what we just created. Importing field zero using a bind, normalizing that vector and then forming the cross product between that and our normal and then exporting this to my field. All right, let's get up one level. Let's just for now visualize my field. And yes, there's something happening. In this case, I don't bother switching the visualizer. I just wanted to see if my field contains data, which it does. All right, let's disable those visualizers and finally start advecting some particles for which we need particles, which brings us to this second stream here because we want to select, let's just reset the viewport here. We just want to select some of those spaced apart points here. And I want to select them using some sort of noise. So first on here, I'll create a noise uh, using an attrib noise. And in this case, I will just set this to be a single float. And let's call this one val for value. And down here, I set the noise type to simplex, the element size to 0.86. And I think that is it. Next, I selected a few points here with a threshold value, just selecting those by the value that we generated here, the noise value. In this case, I'll use a point wrangle, writing two lines of X. So I wanna see on for each point if my val that I just created is smaller than some number which I wanna dial in using a slider. So CHF will create a slider and let's call the slider delete threshold using an underscore like this. Let's create that slider. And if I scroll down here, you can see I have a slider here. So if this add value here, so the value that I generated is smaller than this slider. So let's set it to 0.3. So if the values are smaller than 0.3, let's delete those points using the remove point function that's here. And this one takes as an input our geostream. This is the input zero here. And then it wants to know which point it should delete. And the point we are working on is always the ptnum here. All right, you can see I deleted something here. However, I also want to get rid of all the other geometry here, which I counterintuitively can do using an add node. So add between the attrib noise and the point wrangle and just check delete geometry, just keep the points. And in this case, I just want to invert my selection. So I just want to delete anything that is bigger than our value. So now I'm left with those areas and using this slider here, I can dial in how many of those points I want to keep or not. Let's stick with 0.3 for now. Let's advect points. We're going to advect points using a solver. A solver is a node that has been executed over and over again and has as an input the previous frames data. So we are going to be working on those particles here. And as a directional field, we're going to be using the vector field that we created on this geometry here. So let's wire that into the second slot in here. So let's highlight that solver and go in there. And you can see that previous frame import always works on the previous frames data. However, on the first frame, there is no such thing as a previous frame. So let's use a switch node. And just in case we are on the very first frame, let's switch directly to the input one. In this case, that's this input here. So in here, let's use a small expression called $FF equals equals one. So if our frame is one, the very first frame, then we are going to switch to the second input slot here on the switch, which is the input one, just wiring our geometry that's coming in here through into our solver. However, only on the first frame. Okay, let's wire the switch into our out node. And in between the switch and the out, we will create the particle advection, four lines of X. So I'm going to use a point wrangle, wire that in between here. And as a second input slot, we want to work on this here. We want to read out this vector field coming in through this second input slot here. So in here, let's wire the point wrangle second input to that node called input two. All right, let's just switch the view flag to the out. And on our point wrangle, the first thing we want to do is for each of those individual particles, we want to look up the nearest point on that geometry, on this geometry here, where our vector field is stored. So in the solver, let's do that by first finding out the nearest point towards each of those particles, which will be a point number. That's an integer, let's call this one NPT. And we can find that using the near point function, which will return the nearest point. And let's say the nearest point on that geometry here. So counting from zero, one, two, three, that's input one. 
And we want to find the point close to this point's position, which we can access using V at capital P like this. Next, we want to read out our vector field's direction. So let's create a vector, let's call it there for direction, and it should be equal to the point attributes value that is stored on this point we looked up here. So again, looking up the point attribute values coming in through this second input slot here, our geo with the tangent field, and then the attribute I want to look up is my field, which we just created in the other point pop. And then the point number from which we want to look this field up is this NPT we found. Okay, halfway there, now comes the easy part. Now we wanna move each individual point a bit towards this direction here. So we can do V at P, that is each point's current position, plus equals, that means take this position and add to it this direction here, but make sure it's one first. So it has a length of one. So we normalize it again, normalize there. And then let's again create a slider to drive the speed with which those particles move around. So multiply it with a slider value and we can call this speed or I usually go for amp for amplitude like this. Let's create that slider here and you can see down here we have a slider. In this case, I set this amplitude to minus 0 0.01 just to advect those particles in the opposite direction of our vector field and only a small step each frame. Due to the nature of the particle field, some of those points might have moved away from the surface. So let's project them back onto the original surface using another function called minpos. So after we move those around, let's set their position to their position if they would be projected on this other incoming surface where our tangent field is on. We can do that by using the minpos function and we want to project onto the geometry coming through our second input slot, again id1, and we want to use our current position as the origin of this projection. All right, that is it. Let's go up one level, highlight the solver. Let's save this, keep our fingers crossed and hit play and maybe enable real-time toggle first. And we can see, yes, we are getting those wandering particles. Now let's turn them into lines. And the node to do that is called trail, which will attach down here. And let's set this to connect the individual steps as polygons and uncheck close rows. And also as for the trail length, you could dial this in manually so the trails get longer over time, or you could just set that to the same length as our current frame number using the expression $FF like this. And that makes sure that these trails now grow with each step of our simulation. All right, that is looking nice. That's already one third of the lines I want to generate. Let's generate the other third by just copying and pasting the solver and the trail node that is. And in this case, I want to dive into the solver, but first reset the simulation here to frame zero. And then in here in the point triangle, I want to set the amplitude to point in the direction of the vector field. That is an amplitude of 0 0.01 like this. And this should now generate particles that wander in the exact opposite direction of what's happening over here. And we can see indeed those vector fields look kind of different when we compare them. We could merge them just to check. So let's merge both fields here, highlight this one. Let's just reset this and hit play. And yes, we are getting those vectors and those lines that grow into both directions. Really nice. The third bunch of panel lines I want to create are perpendicular to these lines here. And they should originate at the end points of these lines at maybe 240 or I think in my initial experiments, I even set those to 500 frames. So let's just apply a timeline scale of 500 frames here by clicking into this icon here and then setting the end to 500 like I just did. Then let's skip to the end. It takes a bit of simulation and cooking time. And that's a really dense mesh. Maybe for this, we will go with 240. And let's get rid of this merge here. To be able to only use the endpoints here as the origins of our perpendicular lines, let's drop down a resample node here, which typically is used to finally resample or subdivide those individual lines in a uniform manner. However, I don't want to do that, so I'll uncheck maximum segment length here and instead drag this down here and check curve view attribute, which will generate an attribute on each curve, starting from zero at the beginning of each curve and going to one at the end of each curve. I'll copy and paste this node for our second lines as well, like this. Let's uncheck the point display again. And now I want to delete any points that are not the ends. So in this case, I want to use a delete node set to delete by expression. And I want to delete anything or any point where curve view is smaller than one. So anything that is not the end. Let's write this in here and check the delete node. And let's see, we have nothing left here because we decided to delete primitives. However, we needed to delete points. And now you can see we only are left with the endpoints here. So before and after. Let's copy and paste this delete over here at the second lines as well. And you can see the same thing happening here. So we end up with those two streams of individual points. So those are the endpoints. However, I also want to create a few additional points on those lines in here. So let's merge those while I'm into the merge node here like so. And then again, use a scatter node 
to scatter a bunch of points onto those lines. In this case, let's force a total count of 300. And just for good measure, let's try increasing the relaxation iterations, which doesn't do much. All right, let's just go with it. Now we've got those intermediate points and those endpoints here. Let's merge all three again. And those will be the particles that we will now advect through the perpendicular field to the field that generated both these and these trails here. For that, I can just take one of those solvers and the trail, copy that and paste it down here below the merge like this. Takes a while until it appears. There it is. Let's now just cut the primary input here. The secondary input is still that geometry that generated the tangent and the perpendicular field. However, the first input is now just those individual particles here that we created. Now remember how we created that my field that we used to advect this and this group of particles. We used this cross product trick here in the point bob by taking the cross product between field zero and the normal. So a field that's perpendicular to this my field is just field zero. So in this solver down here, the one we just copied, instead of looking up my field here, let's just look up field zero instead and make sure that the amplitude is set to 0.01. One more thing, before I run this solver here, I wanna make sure that we select those endpoints here only on say frame 240 of this simulation. And for that, up here below the trails, I will insert a really neat and really tricky, handsome, useful node in Houdini. Let's just drag this all down here like so. And in here, let's insert a time shift which can shift the time of our whole Houdini setup to a given frame. In this case, frame 240, because I'm on here, that's fine. And you can see that this changes with my timeline. I don't want that. I want it just set to 240, so I can click in here, just holding down shift and control simultaneously, and then clicking in here, deleting that automatic expression. And then I can just type in any number, in this case, 240. And now I'm gonna wire that into this stream here after the trail one, and let's just copy and paste this time shift and write in over here at the trail two as well, like so. That makes sure that these points down here always stay still and are always static at the same position. That means frame 240. Even at the beginning of this simulation we set up down here. So let's highlight this, press save, again keep our fingers crossed and we can see now at those points we get those perpendicular lines. Again let's copy and paste this time shift here. Just copy and paste it below the trail. So we also let this run to 240. And now let's merge all those individual lines by first again, taking this merge here and using another merge node down here where we wire in the time shifts output like this. And then let's just move this to the side. This merges output like this. And that leaves us with this perpendicular panel lines here. And that's all I wanna do for this tutorial. In the next tutorial, I will go over how to shade and render this using Karma XPU in Houdini 19.5, which I find is coming along really nicely. So I hope you had fun with this one. If you want to support us, are intrigued into learning Houdini or a bit Unreal or a bit Blender, consider becoming a patron of ours because it's through the help of our patrons that we are able to keep Antagma running. And to anyone already out there supporting us, thanks so much, folks, with a very special thank you going out to Important Looking Pirates, Jellyfish Pictures, The Mill, Method Studios, Electric Theater, Pixonic, Ryan 42, Rodeo Effects, Side Effects, Lusion, Style Frame, and Rafik Anadol Studio. Thanks so much for supporting us. So, as always, until next time, it is cheers and goodbye.